In accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act, PL 1975, Chapter 231, adequate notice of this regular meeting of the Planning Board of the Township of Franklin has been provided. If everyone could please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Councilman Chase, Mr. Coble, Mr. LaCourt, here, Ms. MacGyver, here, Mr. Mettler, here, Mr. Pettit, here. Mr. Stevens, Mr. Thomas, Mr. Here. Onyaka, yeah, Chairman Arsini, present. Okay, um, Councilman Chase has arrived, and Councilman Chase. Here comes. Councilman <laughs> Chase has arrived. Aye. Uh, so uh, we'll start with minutes. We have the regular meeting of March the 20th. Motion to approve. Second. Councilman Chase. Yes. Mr. LaCourt. Yes. Mr. Giver. Yes. Mr. Mettler. Yes. Mr. Pettit. Yes. Mr. Thomas. Yes. Mr. Onyaka. Yes. Chairman Arsini. Yes. And the regular meeting of April 3rd, 2013. Motion to approve. Second. Mr. LaCourt. Yes. Ms. MacGyver. Yes. Mr. Mettler. Yes. Mr. Pettit. Oh, he's here. I'm sorry. I'm talking. Yes. Yes. Mr. Thomas. Yes. Oh, uh, that's it. Yep. I was here for that meeting and okay. Seal did it. No, you weren't. I guess you weren't there. Nope. Seal did must a wonderful not have job in meeting. my absence, so I thank her for that. Thank you. Um, an issue with you. Resolutions, oh, okay. I assume we don't have those. Nope. He didn't have the minutes. He'll have a bunch of them for you uh, the next meeting. Okay. Uh, the discussion, uh, only the vouchers, the retainer for April, and uh, the Lemieux litigation. We'll talk about that unless we need to we go into executive and we don't need to. So, um, Motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, against? Abstain? Motion carries. And that leads us into our one and only hearing for tonight, PLN 13-00006, VGS Holdings Incorporated. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Peter Lanford appearing on behalf of the applicant. Uh, the application before the board this evening is an application for site plan approval to expand an existing manufacturing uh, facility located at the intersection of uh, Cottontail Lane and Campus Drive. The addition that we are proposing is approximately 68,000 square feet. Uh, there are a few bulk variances that we will be seeking in conjunction with this uh, application for development, and I'll review those with the testimony of our engineer. Uh, this evening, I have four witnesses. I think I can get all my testimony, and with three witnesses, I have the representative or the owner of the company who is the applicant, <clears throat> my site engineer, and I also have the uh, architect who prepared or designed the addition. I have our traffic consultant here, but having reviewed the, the reports, there are little or no traffic issues. Uh, he's here. If the board wants to ask any questions, I do not intend to call him. Uh, having said that, I would like to call as my first witness, Mr. Virapan Samaranian. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give this board is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. you can sit. Sir, can you state your full name for the record and spell it, please? And you can be seated. <clears throat> I'm Vera Pansubemi and spelled V E E R A P P A N, Subramanian, spelled S U B R A M A N I A N. Mr. Chairman, even before I start with Mr. Sumeranian, um, I did receive yesterday some communication from an, uh, an attorney, Michael Levine, who was here this evening representing an adjoining property owner. Uh, I've had some discussions with him. He has reviewed the plans, and he has asked for uh, my client to consider putting some additional landscaping between our property and his property. 
his property is on uh, the south of our subject property, and their lot number is 1501. Uh, I don't want to keep Mr. Levine here unless he wants to be here, but for the record, I will indicate that I did have a discussion with him. I reviewed it with Mr. Pallas, and we are agreeable to providing some additional landscaping, and my client is also agreeable to providing some additional landscaping, which will obviously be subject to the review of Mr. Healy, uh, the Director of Planning, but it would be at the southerly side of our property, uh, either right adjacent or on the property line or around the detention basin, as the case may be. So, so that I know what to look for, was there any just general parameters that were discussed? Uh, I will shoot you the email, uh, but basically we had some deciduous trees. That he had wanted some evergreens or other things so that we can more screen our parking lot and loading area from his property. Okay. So you can forward that email. I, as a matter of fact, I have a copy of it for you, Mr. Why, why don't you just make that part of the record? And then. Okay. Uh, I've actually pre-marked other exhibits. I will make this... Uh, I'm going to do this sort of backwards because I've pre-marked seven other exhibits so we can mark this A8 in reverse. And then I, I don't think we need to go through it, but if, no. if, the board end, you know, if the board approves it, then this can just be one of the conditions. Would you mind pointing on the... Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, we, we can't. <coughs> Mr. McGyver, I'll, I'll point it out when he okay. testifies. Very good. Thank okay. you. Okay. We'll just confuse the record here. Yep. Mr. Submarinian, uh, you are the owner of the, or your company is the owner of the subject property. Is that correct? That's correct. And that is VGS Holdings? That's correct. Okay. And the subject property uh, that is before the board this evening uh, consists of four lots. Uh, one is an existing uh, office and manufacturing facility. Is that correct? That's right. When did you purchase that property? Uh, in 2002, December. Okay. And it, it, does your company operate at that property? Uh, yes, one of our companies operates at the location. Okay. And what is that company? Uh, Novel Laboratories. Okay. And you're the president of Novel Laboratories? Yes, sir. Since 2002, have you acquired additional properties adjacent to the subject property? Uh, 2002, we acquired uh, 400 campuses as well as we acquired 120 Cotton Tail, which is an acre property. Subsequent to that, recently, the last six months, we acquired two additional lots, 140 and 160 Cotton Tail. Yeah, so you, you, now you own all of those under the name of VGS, is that correct? That's correct. Or the subsidiary thereof called Somerset Property Holdings. Okay. And the, the two last properties that you acquired were houses that were in rather bad condition, is that correct? That's right. Okay. Now, can you indicate to the board briefly what does uh, Novel Laboratories do with the subject property? Well, uh, just uh, I'll take a moment to address the, the board, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mrs. Uh, Vice Chairman, and uh, the members of the board, uh, township officials. Uh, I have had a uh, very good relationship with the township. Uh, I really thank you for situating my businesses in this uh, uh, township since 2002. My business uh, came in 2002 as uh, Cali Laboratories, which uh, subsequently was sold to Par Pharma. This business has been in business in place since 2007. Uh, uh, Novel Laboratories, we are in the business of uh, generic drug manufacturing, development manufacturing, and distribution throughout the country in all 50 states in the U.S. And we employ about 200 people in that very location. Uh, we, again, we manufacture, we warehouse, we package, we distribute out of the location. Okay, now... At the, in addition to the property that is the subject of this application this evening, which is 400 campus, do uh, you also rent other facilities in Franklin Township to conduct your operations? Yes, sir. Uh, adjacent to 400 campus, we do rent a 390 campus, campus which is, VG, which is uh, Gavis Pharmaceuticals. That's our uh, marketing arm. That's a label under which our product goes throughout the country. And, uh, and then we also... Uh, lease another property, which is 15 Jensen, which is our distribution center, and also another property, 400 Abigail Drive, about 11,000 square foot, which is a storage facility. Okay. Now, with respect 
to, and you indicated that you have how many employees at the present time? Uh, roughly 200 employees. Okay, and, and those 200 employees are distributed amongst all of the sites that you testify to. They're not all at 400 Cottontail, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Now, with respect to the addition that you are proposing, can you indicate to the board the purpose of the addition? Uh, the purpose is that we are kind of growing the business fairly quickly. This is a six-year completion. Uh, we, at the, at the time, we are selling about, we have developed and, and, and uh, marketing about 19 different products, generic drug products in the marketplace. Most of our products in the colonoscopy area for people in 50 and over. And that's our main product line under the name Gavi Lights. You go from coast to coast. And we have another nine, another 39 applications of the agency for approval. And they will all get approved over a period of time. And uh, we are looking to expand our facility to manufacture and distribute out of this location. And indeed, we have taken additional, uh, <coughs> signed up and at least an additional facility Levin Jensen, another, another 40,000 square foot that will expand our warehouse going forward. What this location will do is manufacture, package, and uh, that's the main function of this location. You will, in addition, to, if the board grants the site plan approval, so you'll, you'll conduct the expansion on this site, you'll still retain your operation at 390. You're going to retain your operation at Jensen, and actually you're going to expand Jensen. Is that correct? Uh, Jensen will expand from uh, currently 34,000. By the end of the year, it'll be 82,000 with the addition of the uh, Love and Jensen. And God willing, and uh, all those gentlemen up there and the uh, one on the wall willing, we will go into bigger business. Okay. How many employees do you envision adding to uh, your company as a result of this expansion? Uh, we hope to add somewhere from uh, 50, 50 employees or so, could be more or less. Okay. And are those uh, ranging from uh, highly specialized researchers as well as obviously clerical people and, and people of that nature? Uh, yes, true. Most of our employees, we are a technology company. Out of the 200 employees, over 100 employees are highly qualified, master's, PhD level people. We'll continue to add employees of that level, plus also technicians uh, for manufacturing and such. Okay. And at the present time, how many shifts do you run at 400 campus? Uh, we run two shifts at this point. Okay. And with the addition, will you continue to run two shifts? Uh, two shifts at this point. If uh, demands come up, it may be three shifts. Okay. Thank you. I have no further questions of this witness. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, does, does the board have any <coughs> questions? Uh, I, I had one, but I can't answer it. In the oh, okay. A anyone else? To, uh, Ted? No? Just quick, uh, one quick question. The, um, I had the question in my report about the possibility of land banking spaces. So what that means is uh, you're proposing a certain amount of new parking spaces for your facility. Have you had a chance to discuss with your professionals whether, from a practical perspective, you need all of those spaces to, um, you know, to satisfy your employment needs and your parking needs on the site, or whether some of those spaces could be set aside and not improved at this be improved at this yeah, time? We, we did discuss it, Mr. Healy, and uh, quite frankly, because of especially because there's two shifts and there's an overlap with people coming in and other people leaving. Uh, there really is l almost no opportunity to land back. We're going to need all of those parking spaces. Okay. And especially if we do, you know, hire, bring on new employees. Uh, we're only about 13 or, I'm sorry, 23 over your requirements. But um, we looked at it, and I know the sense of this board in this town is to land ba bank, if possible. Uh, in, in this instance, uh, the building does have office <coughs> manufacturing. Not, it's not just a big empty warehouse. So you'll. Yeah, need, so you're saying you're going to need that parking. We're going to need it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, yes. Just one other question: What kind of manufacturing is it? I think I heard colonoscopy type of. Uh, we we manufacture uh, uh, pharmaceutical products, tablets, capsules, powders, uh, liquids, various dosage forms. We we manufacture at the location. Very good. Thank you. Uh, just one request uh, 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 to the to the board and and to more the township officials. We are looking for a uh, to uh, for the space to come in fairly and timely for our uh, uh, launch of products, and that we would uh, request uh, that the township do whatever they can do to help us to uh, get the building on the ground uh, as soon as possible. That'll be our request, humble request. Yeah. Well, we could. Also, uh, 
do a concurrent review. So if you had your construction documents ready while we're going through the planning board, we can start the review in the construction department. They're more than willing to do that. Thank you, sir. I'll, I'll go over that with the Yeah, you can explain. We've done, Pete's done that many a time, so. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Palis. Mr. Chairman, do you have a question? Oh, I just wanted to mention, this is not a question, but there's a, a program called Live Where You Work, and the township has flyers on it that essentially facilitates new employees. If they want to buy a house in the township, it helps them with their down, it's a state program, helps them with their down payment on the basis that if they live in the same township where they work, they're commuting is much, much less than if they live 30 miles away, so they uh, <clears throat> really can afford a little more in the way of a house. So as you start hiring new employees, do get these flyers on the Live Where You Work uh, program. Thank you, Seth. That will bring their employees in, which will be big help to our employees to locate living town when they're great enough to live in town. Yeah. John, can you please be sworn? Sure. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give this board is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. State your full name for the record, please. John A. Palis, P-A-L-U-S. Mr. Palis, by whom are you employed? Uh, Dynamic Engineering. And can you give the board the, the benefit of your educational and professional background, please? Uh, certainly. I have a bachelor's and a master's in civil engineering from Rutgers University. I'm a licensed professional engineer in the state of New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Texas. I'm also a licensed professional planner in the state of New Jersey. I have testified before over 125 various planning boards, zoning boards throughout the state, uh, including this board some number of years ago, uh, primarily. You're qualified and accepted. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Palis, uh, before the meeting started this evening, we pre-marked certain exhibits that are on a board to our left. Uh, can you, first of all, uh, referring to Exhibit A1, uh, indicate to the board where the subject property is and the surrounding land uses around the subject property. Uh, certainly. I do have reduced copies of, I'm not sure what exhibit it is. That'll be three. A3 um, that I can pass around, which may help you. Uh, real quick, Exhibit A1 is the aerial exhibit. Dated April 30th, 2013. A2 is the survey prepared by Blue Marsh Associates uh, that was submitted as part of the site plan application. And then A3 is a color version of the landscape plan overlaying on top of the site plan drawing. That's entitled Site Plan Rendering, dated May 1st, 2013. Okay. First of all, Mr. Palis, can you indicate to the board what the existing conditions are at the subject property? Sure. Uh, the property is identified as Block 517.06, Lots 9, 10.01, 11, and 13.01. Uh, between the four lots, it's 6.53 acres located in the light manufacturing zone. We're located at the southeast corner of Cottontail Lane and Campus Drive. We have approximately just over 1,000 linear feet of frontage on Cottontail Lane and approximately 620 linear feet of frontage on Campus Drive. Looking at Exhibit uh, A1, directly to the property here is, uh, top of the page is north. The property is outlined by a white line uh, entitled PIQ for partial <coughs> question. And here we are at the southeast corner. Cottontail Lane is directly to our west, and then Campus Drive is to the north and then also to the east. Uh, directly to our north, we have office. Uh, to our east, some additional office. Uh, Further to the south along the east property line is the adjacent lot that has some additional uh, warehouse manufacturing abilities. To the south, uh, we have some office, and to the west, uh, we have some additional manufacturing. Uh, referring to Exhibit A2, which is the survey, lot 9, which is where uh, the existing 400 campus drive parcel is, the building is located today. Uh, you have a 37,768 square foot footprint, which is the manufacturing and warehouse. Uh, there's 73 parking spaces, uh, three loading docks, two on the north side. There's an additional one on the south side. 
Um, you have one driveway located off of Cottontail uh, toward the north end of the property. Off of that, you have uh, 14 parking spaces. It's a little bit of a dead-end parking situation. You also have a driveway further south on the easterly property line to Campus Drive, uh, where you have some dead-end parking on the south side of the building. Uh, there are several pads uh, located on the west side of the property adjacent to Cottontail Lane. Um, you have an air conditioner unit on a pad. You also have several utilities, a utility building uh, that are located along that frontage. There is um, uh, an old fence, 10-foot fence, that's a little bit beaten up at this point. Um, on site today, there's no stormwater management system. Uh, there is a slight swale here along Campus Drive, but that, I believe that actually collects stormwater from Campus Drive, brings it across our property, and then discharges it back into the collection system further uh, north on uh, campus drive. Mr. Palis, also on the subject property on the uh, recently acquired lots, what's located there? I'm getting there. Lot 10.01 okay. uh, is essentially a vacant lot that's uh, directly to the south of uh, lot 9. Oh. And then as you travel further south, you have two additional lots. And what you're looking at uh, are two residential uses. <coughs> and I have some photos uh, that we we mark um, showing those two homes. There's uh, three pictures of lot 11, two pictures of lot 13.01. And I've marked them for the record as one package of photographs, and I've marked them A7, and I'll start them with, we only have one set, so I'll start them with Mr. Pettit, if that's okay with you, Mr. Chairman. It's fine. Lot 11 has a two-story building, uh, residence, very run down. Uh, there's a masonry garage, uh, similarly, uh, windows broken, just uh, seen better days, certainly. There's one driveway to that lot. And there's also an additional shed at the southeast corner of the property. Lot 13 uh, is somewhat of a disaster. Uh, it has a one-story frame building. There's a long garage on the northeast corner of the property. Um, the first time I visited the site, I had assumed that they had taken everything out of the garage because of the flood and they were trying to dry everything out. But it appears that that was actually just a current condition that was being maintained, that they were just had outdoor storage. Um, similar to uh, Lot 11, you have one driveway off of Cottontail uh, to that property. Uh, just for reference, when you look at the overall existing conditions before the, the three additional lots were purchased, when it was four separate lots, um, you have a situation where you have two non-conforming uses in the two residential located in the M1 light manufacturing zone. Um, all the lots uh, did not meet the minimum lot area. Uh, the three lots to the south of lot nine uh, all did not meet the minimum lot frontage. Uh, the existing lot nine had a front yard setback of 25.4 feet to the building. Uh, that's located here. There's a little bit of a nook actually closer to the intersection, like a, almost like a, a 20 foot uh, cut in, and that's where that 25 foot setback is. And then uh, there's uh, 18, foot set, set, 18 foot set back to an electrical room uh, located on the north end of the building as well. There's a side yard set back to one of the existing residential homes at 22.7 feet. Uh, there's a minimum accessory front yard set back, which is 14.5 feet to the utility building. That's on lot 9. Uh, minimum accessory side yard set back, which is 3.9 feet to one of the garages on the residential properties. Minimum accessory rear yard, uh, 4.5 feet to one of the, the garages on the residential properties. Uh, there is a parking deficiency currently under existing conditions for lot 9, where 84 are required, 73 are provided. Um, minimum drive aisle width, your ordinance requires 26 feet. On the southerly uh, drive aisle, it actually tapers down <coughs> to 21.1 feet. Uh, parking setback, 5 foot is required. We have 2.6 feet. Uh, to our southerly property line today. And there's also a sign vertical dimension where I believe the, the vertical dimension of the sign is four foot three inches where four foot is allowed. So those are all existing variances that occur today uh, along the four properties. Okay. Mr. Palis, can you now go to exhibit, I think, A3 and describe to the board what we are proposing? Certainly. Fortunately, with the current economic cli uh, climate, uh, the applicant has been lucky enough to be able to be very successful and have the need to expand their property. So when we sat down, uh, 
uh, their main goal was to be able to stay on the property, utilize the existing building, but to expand and expand the building in such a way that it would be able to meet their needs so that they didn't have to relocate outside of the property. So we are proposing a 67,900 square foot addition, uh, referring to Exhibit A3. And for the purpose of my testimony, north is to the <coughs> right side of the page. The existing building is a light brown. Uh, the proposed building here is almost a, a golden brown, if you will. Uh, with the addition, the total square footage, including the second floor part of the existing structure, uh, goes to 112,848 square feet. <coughs> we are proposing a total of 151 parking spaces. It will be ADA compliant. The majority of the parking will actually be located on the east side of the new structure. So it's going to be tucked behind, so it's not visible from the street. The existing parking located uh, on the north side of the building will remain. That's going to remain untouched. Uh, and we're going to be redesigning some of the parking here, but keeping the existing driveway over on Campus Drive. We have a total of four new loading docks on the south side of the building, which effectively replaces just one of the loading docks that was there on the existing south side. Uh, there will also be a compactor there. We will have a private hauler uh, that will be responsible for all waste removal. As part of the overall application, we are increasing a substantial lot area in addition to Lot 9. And we are proposing only one additional driveway on the southwesterly corner of the property, Lane, uh, 36 fo uh, foot wide throat. And that's primarily going to be access for uh, the loading uh, on the south side of the building. Uh, we are also at this point including uh, three pads, essentially they're 12 foot by 25 foot uh, pads. They're essentially for um, I, I, AC units, uh, chilling units, uh, accessory structures essentially for uh, the warehouse and manufacturing use. And those are set back at a, a 20 foot setback. Um, similar to what you have under existing conditions where you have several utilities located here on the west side of the existing structure, what we're going to do is we're going to extend that 10 foot high chain link fence, wrap it all the way down the westerly facade. All those structures are going to be tucked behind that fence. And in addition, what we're going to do is we're going to fix up the existing fence in a couple places where it's a little bit dinged up and we're going to put in privacy slats. So all of the fence will have 10 foot with the privacy slats. Um, and then there will be a couple points uh, where, where we have uh, emergency egress from the building. There's three of them, or I'm sorry, four of them proposed on the west side. And at those points, your uh, fire official has requested that we provide actually uh, security gates for, for egress. And also if the fire department needs to come in through that side of the building. So there will be four doors in that 10-foot uh, fence on that side. Um, there's also uh, one small uh, feature uh, drainage ditch that's located just south of lot 9 on the essentially on that lot line. Uh, it's a small drainage ditch. It's considered an ordinary resource value wetland. Uh, we've already filed with the DEP for uh, statewide general permit number seven just to fill that. Uh, as far as the drainage, we are proposing uh, an increase in impervious uh, coverage. In fact, our impervious coverage grows uh, up to 64.9%, where 60% is the ordinance, and I'll, I'll discuss that a little bit later. Uh, but as far as our stormwater management system, uh, we are proposing a essentially a, a dual uh, type of structure. We have the entire roof structure drains to the detention basin that's located on the south side of the lot. Uh, and as long as I'm talking about it, there was a, a slight error in um, one of our details, we forgot to remove the uh, note about sand at the bottom. There is no sand. This is a detention basin, so we have adequate separation uh, to the seasonal high water table, uh, just to clarify in the engineer's comment. And we also have an underground system located here on the east side of the, the building uh, addition, and that's going to collect the new asphalt areas, and we're going to bring that into that system. And then what they'll do is they'll be attenuated and then drained to we have an underground uh, storm filter device which addresses water quality. So before it gets into that structure, we address the rate of runoff, then it goes to the, the storm filter where we address water quality measures, and then it's discharged uh, out to an existing inlet located uh, just south of our property in, uh, in Cottontail Lane. Uh, so as, as part of the improvement, uh, where today all of the southerly part of the property drains sheet flow to Cottontail Lane, that's going to be primarily all picked up and drained via pipe, so it's not uh, stormwater running in the street. It's actually going to be plugged in and 
you won't see it, so there will be uh, less ponding on Cottontail Lane uh, and icing, you know, potentially. Uh, one of the other comments, we were sheet flowing just a small area into the basin. Uh, as long as the Delaware Raritan Canal Commission is fine with that, we can write, uh, just put an inlet in for your engineer's comment. I'm not sure one way or another, it doesn't matter. We were just trying to collect some uh, unconnected <coughs> impervious coverage. Uh, and there was a request for a four-foot fence with a gate around the perimeter uh, for security purposes, which we would certainly agree to. And just give the board a general idea in terms of what this development is doing in terms of reductions for the stormwater. For the two-year storm under existing conditions, uh, the rate of runoff is 8.54 uh, CFS. We're dropping that down to 2.44 CFS. So it's a substantial reduction from uh, what you see under existing conditions. And further on the 100 year storm, uh, hopefully we don't see any more of those for a while. We're currently at 28.57, and we're going to be dropping it to just over 15 uh, CFS. As far as the landscaping, obviously our frontage on Cottontail Lane was the, the main focus. And what we've done is a staggered <laughs> row of evergreens uh, across that uh, frontage. There were a couple small <coughs> gaps. I'm going to have to ship those around a little bit. Uh, in accordance with the fire officials letter, I will have to create a couple gaps for access into uh, the gates for their purposes. But we'll make sure that there are no other gaps uh, associated with that. Uh, we also had a number of uh, shade trees that we were proposing here on the, the southerly property line. We got some feedback from our neighbor, and obviously we would like to be good neighbors. So uh, we can essentially re replace those trees and put in um, a slightly staggered row of evergreen trees. Um, and essentially, uh, there is a little bit of a wall between our property and his property. So my recommendation is probably going to run in a similar location as where the trees are, but actually run it straight down so that we have a nice straight line, uh, which will shield him from the loading dock and then the parking on the easterly side of the property. Yeah, if I could interrupt real quick, because I just want to make sure uh, there's not a conflict between what the um, joining property owner is asking for and what Carl has in his report. That, um, that, actu that actually ties directly in with what Carl had, because he okay. didn't want the trees, um, because as they got bigger, they might obstruct uh, trucks when they were loading, okay, because, so, because of the overhang. So he's saying, because he's saying relocate the trees at the end, and then you're, you're, you're saying you're going to re... So I guess when you, you have them on the, I'll just say the right side, you're saying you can relocate them to another location? Well, uh, I'm going to swap them out with evergreens. He was concerned with the deciduous trees because of the canopy because okay. that will extend very wide. And that as trucks come in, they're using this area here for loading and that the overhang of the canopy okay. might conflict with the trucks. Got it. So, in order so it's not a matter of having a tree um, along the perimeter of the basin getting in the way of the clay core or something. I don't even know no. if there is one. But it's not a matter of, it's a function of the movements in the loading area not having a having the trees on the rim of the base. Correct. And we can build two birds with one stone, okay. meet the neighbors and Carl's comment. Got you. Thank you. So <clears throat> while we're still on, uh, uh, John, while we're still on uh, landscaping, um, maybe this will address some of the other comments. So from your landscape plan, you've identified per township ordinance all of the trees of a certain caliper, et cetera. Um, what needs to be done as per uh, the comments in the uh, 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 John's report was uh, or Carl's report, rather, was, um, you know, do the actual calculations that stem from that. And um, so two questions stem from that. Just looking at your landscape plan, uh, I would like to see the, the calorie pair not, not be there. Um, it's not a recommended species of the township because of the breakage in storms. Uh, <clears throat> that could easily be replaced with a, a flowering tree that would be more uh, appropriate. Uh, for the site and you know withstand the conditions that we all experience here uh, all too frequently apparently lately um, I think Hurricane Sandy uh, other than pines spread for pears were the most wrecked species that I saw driving around the township so um, you know there's plenty of other good things like Yoshino cherries and you know I, I don't need to go down the list but right. you, you get the idea uh, the other thing is on the frontage on campus drive um, I assume that you'll probably, by dint of your calculations, be owing some trees, uh, just because, you know, you're covering a lot of the site. Right. Um, is there room for any trees along the existing frontage and the existing building and parking on campus where there seems to be just a large amount of green space? 
uh, there, there is a swale there mm -hmm. that runs that actually it's not we don't use that it's actually for campus drive mm -hmm. uh, but I think we could add some trees to kind of offset that like uh, white oaks do really well in that kind of or uh, October glory red maple or like uh, or swamp white oaks which you can still get your hands on I think do really well in those kind of wet conditions they'll soak that up um, and of course, everything you plant on site, as is, is you well know, Peter, right, is deducted from what you would owe in a, a in-kind contribution based on any calculation. So it, it behooves you to try to, to try to plant on site. And of course, you've already addressed. I, I don't know what type of pines that you're using to satisfy Mr. Levine, but um, I, I would hope that they might be more of the the spruce and not the white pine. No white pines. Okay, great. No. And that we're totally against that, but I think in this site, you, you know, the denser and more, uh, uh, you know, the, the denser type of screening that, that spruce provide would do the trick. I think your other species <coughs> on your landscape plan is Shade Master Locust, and they're fine. So, okay. Does that all sound okay? Yeah. That'll probably leave us not having to talk about that particular comment. No. We'll be fine with those, and we'll make sure you have an opportunity to review the uh, final plant list. Right. Mr. Palace, very briefly, uh, we have not yet touched on lighting. If you can just briefly indicate if we are proposing any lighting in the park. First of all, what is the existing lighting, and what lighting are we proposing on the subject property? Sure. The existing lighting is uh, pretty sparse, uh, to be quite honest. We are pro providing... Uh, Six area lights. Uh, they're shoebox fixtures at a 16-foot height, metal halide. Uh, it will be a flat lens. It will not be a sag lens. And then uh, also with the expanse of the building, we have uh, 18 building-mounted fixtures. Uh, nothing super bright. We kept it uh, actually fairly low in order to uh, you know, keep the light levels down, but safe enough uh, when it's dark that pedestrians would be able to walk safely into the, the warehouse. Okay, now, in your statement concerning the existing conditions, uh, you indicated that there were a slew of existing variances uh, that uh, came with the property, so to speak. Uh, we are also asking for some new variances, and we are eliminating numerous variances. Uh, can you, just so we have the record clear, please review the variances that we are going to be asking for and those that will continue to remain as a result of this application. Okay. Uh, the first one would be for minimum front yard setback. Uh, that's along Cottontail Lane. The existing building, you have that one corner where uh, some right away was taken. Uh, it's 25.4 feet, but when you extend a little bit further to the south along Cottontail, uh, we have a 44.8 foot setback. Obviously, with the building expansion, we would like to maintain a very uh, consistent frontage. Uh, so we are actually maintaining that same setback, which creates some uniformity. And so we have a 44.8 foot setback associated with the new building, uh, which would be a variance because 50 foot is required uh, in order to uh, offset that potential impact. Uh, because we are tying into an existing building, we are uh, going to add the staggered row of evergreens, which are Norway spruces and Colorado blue spruces, so they're substantial, uh, along with the 10 foot fence with the privacy slats. We also have a uh, minimum front yard setback for an accessory structure. Uh, you heard me testify before that there's already an existing building uh, that's with a 14.5 foot setback and a, uh, some additional pads. Uh, we're looking to add a couple pads behind that fence. Uh, they're 12 foot by 25 foot pads. They would have a 20 foot setback uh, where your ordinance <coughs> requires 50. Uh, again, we're trying to maintain some uniformity. We, we have the fence here that we're going to provide, the staggered row of evergreens. It's going to be tucked behind that. And we already have a couple uh, structures, structures already there, so it's going to be consistent with what you would see as you drive down Cottontail today. Quick, just an extension. Quick question on that. The structures that are going to go on those pads, what, how tall, how big, how tall are those structures? I'm going to defer to the architect. Uh, okay. We'll have more information on that. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, as far as impervious coverage, I testify that uh, we're slightly over the ordinance requirement, the 64.9%, where the ordinance allows 60. Uh, part of that is we're, we're, we're really tied in because we're trying to utilize the existing structure. We want to stay here at this location rather than have to, to relocate. But in order to uh, meet the demands with the expansion of the use, uh, we had to go a little bit above the impervious coverage. And 
really what we did as, as part of our design because we were aware of that and the township is sensitive to it. We went a little bit above and beyond in terms of the stormwater management design. And we have substantial reductions in the stormwater design uh, offset with that, plus uh, the extensive landscaping that we'll do along Cottontail Lane. Uh, there's also a parking setback, a uh, parking lot setback. Five foot is required. Uh, we're proposing 3.9 feet for the parking spaces on the east side of the building. There's also a small, uh, for truck circulation, it actually ended up being 3.4 feet. In this area here, I can make the five foot. I can just pull that curve back. So I can meet the five foot, so the 3.4 foot won't apply, but the 3.9 foot does. Um, and that's an area that's <coughs> tucked away. Nobody, quite honestly, nobody will see. Uh, we, we have the existing setback at 2.6 feet, so it's, it's better than what's actually out here on the existing lot nine. Uh, but we have the 3.9 foot. Uh, really, there's no negative impact. We could, uh, we could increase it, but I think it's appropriate to have a buffer on the east side of the building to protect the cars from hitting the building. Uh, for the parking lot aisle width, your ordinance requires 26 feet. I'll reiterate, there is uh, a 21.1 foot existing here on, off the driveway from campus. We are also proposing 24 foot on the east side of the building. Uh, really, there's no truck circulation uh, anticipated here. I know the ordinance uh, requires just 26 foot. We actually ran the fire truck, uh, your township fire truck, and it works. And uh, John, you know, agreed that he has no problems with the circulation. Uh, 24 foot is an industry standard. We could increase it to the 26 foot, but it would be just additional impervious surface, which we don't feel is necessary uh, at this time. Uh, you said you're you're increasing the 21 foot to 26 or 24. I didn't I didn't get there yet. Okay. I, so we're gonna. My recommendation is to hold with the 24 foot on the east side. Now, there is a 21.1 foot uh, aisle with um, here on, you know, it impacts roughly 30 parking spaces. Mm -hmm. That's an existing condition. So they operate today with that. Uh, we maintain that. If the board felt it was appropriate, we could certainly realign the uh, northerly edge of the parking on that side uh, to get to 24 foot, but it would be additional impervious surface. Uh, we don't feel it's really necessary. We don't have trucks. We don't have deliveries coming through here. Uh, it's an existing condition. They have never had a problem. Uh, but if the board feels it's appropriate, we can certainly increase it to uh, 24 foot, and there would be a slight increase in, in, in the impervious coverage. Uh, the, the vertical dimension of the sign, uh, which is, in, I don't know if they ever obtained a variance back in the day, but four foot three inches is existing. I guess the ordinance requires four foot, so it would be a variance, I guess, just to get on the record that we do have a variance for that. And I believe the last one is uh, you're only allowed two driveways to a property. Uh, under existing conditions, we have two driveways. They're separate uh, areas, both essentially dead-end parking. We are proposing a, a, a third driveway, which would be further south. I would note that under existing conditions, uh, the two residential lots have driveways. So if you added them all up, you would have four under existing conditions. We're reducing to three. Um, plus, this allows us for, uh, to eliminate dead-end parking, which I feel is important. And I'm sure your, your fire official agrees that it's nice to be able to circulate uh, the building without having to back up and stop. Um, I think that covers, unless I missed any. No, I, I think we got all the variances. And uh, in your capacity as a planner, do you have an opinion as to whether these uh, variances can be granted without any detrimental impact to the zone scheme or zone plan? No, and I don't think there's, there's uh, I don't think there's any negative impact associated with them, and they are offset by uh, the additional landscaping and fencing that are being provided, and minimizing the impervious surface as much as we can. See this? So you would think that they would be qualified under C2? They would be C2 variances. Now, with respect to the staff reports, and I think we've touched on them very briefly. Um, just let's go through them uh, real quickly. I think there's only a couple of comments that need to be discussed. Uh, obviously, Mr. Dominic pointed out the variances. I think we've discussed them. We've reviewed the uh, report of John House. Uh, we can comply with all of his uh, comments in that report. Is that correct? Yes. Health department has no issues. Sewage department has no issues. Uh, with respect to the report of Mr. Healy, uh, 
I think we've covered everything. Anything that we have not specifically covered on the record, we will agree to consolidate the lots. We will do the tree calculations, and the we, we will clarify the information on the lighting. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And then we have a report from Mr. Houck, uh, dated April 26th. And I think the only thing that we need, well, under general review comments, uh, there was a comment by Mr. Houck that we should consider relocating the existing Norley driveway from Cottontail Lane uh, to Campus Drive. The existing driveway is within the traffic signal lane area. Can you please indicate, first of all, to the board where Mr. Houck is talking about relocating the driveway? Certainly. Uh, referring to Exhibit A3, on the north end of the property, I indicated that we do have a small area where uh, two loading docks, you have a, a compactor on that end, you have the driveway to Cottontail and 14 parking spaces. And I believe Mr. Houck is requesting that we take this driveway that ties into Cottontail Lane and tie it in over here toward uh, Campus Drive. We did look at that. Um, one of the items is we actually do have a swale that runs through here, which would be impacted if we tried to do that. Um, also, if we were to actually try to tie that in, we would end up losing parking spaces because where the driveway would tie out the campus drive, um, and you wouldn't be able to regain a, essentially the same number of spaces on the north side without creating some additional impervious coverage. So uh, I don't know that there's a benefit on that end. And finally, uh, from a site visibility, uh, the angle of campus drive here, uh, most likely you're pulling out and making a right headed in the northbound direction, uh, where if you're trying to get further north toward 287, leaving uh, toward Campus Drive, you have to watch for oncoming traffic, which is coming at an angle in addition to the traffic that's already headed uh, north on Campus Drive. So it creates a, a little bit of an additional conflicting movement. So it's in existing condition. Uh, there's only 14 parking spaces. Uh, two loading docks so that you have very low traffic generator uh, from that driveway. Uh, so, you know, we did look at it, but we feel that it's a, in its current location and design is the best place to, for it. In addition to looking at it, did you discuss with the applicant whether there's been a history since he's owned the property of any accidents uh, uh, at that intersection of we, that driveway? We, we did, and the applicant has indicated that he's unaware of any accidents that have occurred since they've occupied the building. Okay, so our... our position is that we did consider it, we did review it, and we would like to leave it where it is. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and with respect to the remainder of Mr. Hout's report, we can comply with everything else. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, uh, just before you leave that, I, it was one, uh, one more landscaping comment that I noticed on your plan was that you had some trees that you designated to be relocated. Mm -hmm. uh, is that true? Uh, at least there's a legend that says tree to remain, tree to be removed, tree to be relocated. I, that might be a, just a standard key. Oh, okay. Because I, I was going to say, I, I mean, I, I don't know that we've had too many applications where they propose to actually relocate trees, but generally it doesn't work out real well. I'd rather just have you, you know, re take them down and then replace them. We were not looking to relocate I, I, okay. any trees. No further questions of this witness. I have one thing. Bob, I just want to make sure that I'm on the same page with all of you on the campus drive side of the building, uh, the swale and the trees and everything. I, I <clears throat> campus drive is a main street through that area, and while that's your backyard, it's a lot of businesses front yard. So I'd like to make sure or tie up things a little more formally. I think there ought to at least be a minimum number of street trees or something done in conjunction with Mark, not necessarily to hide the building, but to between the parking lot and the driveway, at least make it look like a little bit more front yard as opposed to rear yard. <coughs> mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, as far as I'm concerned, if they owe money for tree replacement, I, I, I would say forget the money, put it into this. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I, that's why I asked the question. And I think that the way the building is cut out where you have those angles, you have room for groupings of trees that actually could look very nice with street trees and, and perhaps flowering trees, in, you know, nestled in there. And, and so I think that that would, that would be a preference of mine to have that done. 
I think when they actually when they do the calcs that they're going to have not a substantial number but they're going to have to probably be several dozen I think in terms of the the replacement number so I think mm -hmm. a condition could be that they need to maximize the uh, amount actually on the site mm -hmm. and that along uh, campus drive uh, it'll uh, have to be uh, uh, placement of street trees at a at least 40 to 50 feet on center so there's a, an actual um, consistent row of, of trees uh, they'll have to work around the existing conditions. Yeah, there, there are 14 street trees along Campus Drive mm -hmm. under current conditions. They're six-inch uh, caliper right now. Okay. And so they're so projected to remain. Right? They are remaining. Okay. Yeah, okay, I mean, so obviously, whatever you can enhance around those or add to them if there are gaps, et cetera, like Bob said, I mean, we always, even when I was chair of the Shade Tree Commission, we always prefer that, you know, things remain on site rather than having to pay in lieu contributions. So... That's that's always there's, there. there's some lawn areas, so they, I'm sure they'll be able to fit in some flowering trees, yeah. you know, in between the existing street trees, yeah. and because that's the only place where, frankly, where it can go. So I think yeah. that's that can be the wording of the condition, and to the degree they can't, then the rest will be in lieu. That that's acceptable to my client, Mr. Chairman. Anything else from the board for this witness? Uh, Ten. I'd just like to say I'm a bit uncomfortable with that 21-foot aisle in the existing parking lot, and I would be happier if you got it up to 24. Uh, it's, it's not a question of truck traffic through. It's a question of if two people have Ford Explorers parked across from each other, are they really going to have, you know, is it going to be tight backing out? Oh. Well, well, you know, you probably ran the numbers. What would the, you, you said the trade-off was extra impervious coverage, which would exacerbate your variance that you're asking for, so you're trying to minimize that. But if you were to increase it to 24, which you said you could, what, what would that do to the impervious going from 64? It's minimal. It's two and a half feet by 100, well, it's yeah, it's, yeah, by whatever that is. It's so been, not really going to. Yeah, and, and, and typically, typically the board has in the past for, Minimal areas like this, they've asked to, you know, to make it to the 24 just to be consistent. You know, if it was a, a run of a thousand feet in the back, right. you know, where John only needed a couple feet, but this is rather minimal. So to bring it up to the, to the 24, I think Jim would agree is kind of what yeah, this board is standardly done. The 21.1 foot aisle space is dead end right now. It's no longer to be dead, and it's going to tie into the other 24-foot aisle that's going to be constructed alongside the new building. So I would say make it 24 and be done with it. We're fine with that. And if it increases the impervious from 64.9 well, to 65.1 or whatever, that's... Yeah, it's, it's, a, few, it's a few percent. hundred square feet. Given your stormwater handling, I think you're not really too concerned about that. One question I had for you, if you mind, if I may. Go ahead, okay. Jim. Uh, I was a little confused by your comment about the stormwater detention basin with the sand layer. You said that there's a mistake on the drawing? Our, that you're our, not doing it that way? Our, our detail, it's a detention basin. The, the separation you're not making it a settlement basin. Uh, right. Uh, it, it's a recharge basin. basin. You're making a detention basin. Right. So the issue of the elevation of the separation of the de of the sand from the groundwater is right. only a foot instead of two feet? Correct. Feet so you, okay, so, because Carl makes that comment, if you notice right. comment. Uh, it, it, on the detail, it, it's actually, uh, it's kind of almost floating, the six yeah, okay. inches of sand, so, but it's not there. So that comment doesn't yeah. really apply anymore? Correct. Uh, if I may ask a couple of other things. Go ahead. Um, well, we talked about the driveway width. You don't have a problem with that. The only other issue I had is he did mention the campus drive entrance being in the in the tra in the uh, stacking lane, I guess, for the new signal. When this built, when the original building was built, as you can tell by looking at it, that was the only access point, and it was done because there was a loading dock that they had to get their semi trailers into. It appears from these uh, architects' plans that those loading docks are no longer in use. Is that correct? No, the, those line, they they will remain, but they don't show that on the inside of the building. In other words, if you look at the pl the floor plan from the, from the architect. It doesn't, there is no particular place that you would unload stuff and bring it into the building, from what I can see. Well, the exhibit, <coughs> you exhibit it, 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 it says, that, says yeah, well, loading dock. It's okay. I just yeah. want to know if that loading dock is still staying and it's active. Yes, it is. So you need that driveway to get your tractor trailers in. Correct. Otherwise, you could do what Carl wanted, is put it on coming from Scampus Drive, put a pipe over the little, that, that swale is pretty minimal. 
you could put a small pipe there and run it in from campus drive and, cl and close that up Bless you. Bless you. so it wouldn't create any conflict it's not a major issue i'm just mm -hmm. want to make it clear jim what do you go ahead what do you think of his the, the response to that though that if if most of the exiting traffic is going to be presumably towards 287 the existing situation they're making a right whereas if you move it and go to campus then the exiting traffic has to make a left no, I, and they have to yeah, I, don't, I don't think it's a major issue. I don't I yeah. really think I do have, do In fact, it only serves, if I'm reading this correctly, it only serves that small number of parking. 14. 14. Yeah, 14 parking uh -huh. places. And the key to it was whether or not that loading dock was going to be abandoned or not abandoned. Mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's going to be used, then they have to bring the tractor trailer in, give it room to maneuver it back into the loading dock. So in my view, then that's not even an issue anymore. Well, yeah, I mean, and the other point that Mr. Palis already made when he discussed this whole issue earlier was that if you do bring out that driveway, you are on a curve on Campus Drive, and to me that that's probably... Well, worse. you could bring it out in the flat part. I mean, we have a long straight run, you know. Yeah. yeah. But again, we're Maybe increasing impervious out. coverage. Well, you're it's still not right. a major issue. It's okay. I'm, I'm happy with it. Mm. Not that I have to be happy, but it's not happy. <laughs> we like it when you're happy. Well, thank it's you good to get your happy. Sure. You're happy. Good, yeah, happy. It's good to make Slap you happy. Slap happy. <laughs> Anything else from the board? Uh, is this your only? I just want to know. Is the that architect very brief. Just to clarify, that loading dock is still going to be used. Yes, and the architect can confirm that. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's have the uh, architect. Mr. Shaw. <coughs> Assuming that Mr. Shaw is licensed to practice architecture in the state of New Jersey, is all I really need to he, hear from him when he when he's he, he is. We still have to have him sworn. Though. That's right, Mr. Shaw. Raise your right hand. Do you swear from that the testimony you're about to give the board is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, Mr. Shaw. You have a colored rendering of the proposed building, and actually, we do have some exhibits. And what I'd like you to do is just very briefly indicate to the board while I hand this out exactly what we are proposing with our addition, so the board can understand both the interior and the exterior functioning of the building. Again, uh, we we have submitted originally. We have submitted the floor plans and the elevations as part of the original exhibits. Uh, that's exactly what I'm going to present. And one additional exhibit that you're going to see, which is being distributed right now, it's a 3D rendering of the the building looking from Cottontail Lane. Uh, what in front of what you see is a floor plan drawing SK1, which was part of the original submission to the board indicates the breakdown of a floor uh, with various uses that is going to be occupied in this building. It, it basically shows the warehouse area, manufacturing area, and portion of the space will be the offices. Again, as, as our client applicant explained, the functions of the space, this is going to be utilized for uh, manufacturing solid dosages, liquid dosages. They're going to manufacture tablets here, package tablets here, and they're going to store in the warehouse, and it's going to be distributed amongst various uh, parts of the country. Uh, as, we, as we showed, uh, the building is a one-story, 29 feet high, one-story building. And as you see, it's an extension on the south side of the existing building. It's a linear uh, footprint, and about obviously it is because of the shape of the size of the land that we have. Um, the the building, as I said, I'm going to turn to exhibit A5. SK2, this is also part of the exhibit that we had, uh, the submission we had made. It is the exterior elevation shown from all four sides of the, of the building. Uh, the building, again, as I said, is 29 feet tall. It tapers down towards the Cottontail Lane for draining the roof, uh, roof, uh, roofing uh, rain. And in the, on the south side of the building, we have four, four loading bays. The building is going to be constructed with uh, the prefabricated concrete panels, insulated panels. And one of the comments that we had uh, to show the material that we're going to be using, I have samples if we want to see that later, it is going to be precast pre concrete panels fabricated on site, being that the materials are going to be sustainable to reduce the carbon footprint because everything is going to be fabricated right on, on the site. 
The building is going to be ADA accessible, handicap accessible. It's about a dual color tone. And just right there, I would, I would point out to the, the rendering that was submitted there. That's exhibit A6. Now what you see is, is a, a view from south side of Cottontail that has been discussed for, before by, by John. Uh, the building is 29 feet tall. It is separated with various core lines to break up the monotony of the facade. Obviously, it's a rectangular building. We wanted to make it look a little different, so what we did, we introduced sky, high bay, clear story glass, which gives you natural lighting inside the building and reduced energy usage for artificial lighting, as well as we raised corners a little bit to break up the straight line box, boxy looking facade. It is a dual tone concrete painted structure, which is going to be concrete. And if you look at the south side of this property, there are buildings very similar to this. So we try to keep the architecture of the building similar to what the neighbor looks like. We did not want to create something foreign to the area. And we tried hard to match the uh, architecture of the, of the area. What we're also showing is a 10-foot fence, which will be covered with slats, which will also hide some of the equipment that we we're going to put behind the, the fence. One of the questions was how tall these HVAC equipment is going to be. We are going to be putting in a chiller, which is approximately 7 feet high on a 4-inch high concrete pad. And then we're going to have a couple of dust collectors those are a little bit tall, about 10 feet high with some ductwork running up into the building. And then we would have a couple of HVAC units sitting on the floor, similar, about seven feet high from the ground. In addition to that, we would have about four inches concrete pad. Again, as you see the row of all of the landscaping, the intent was to hide as much as we could uh, all the equipment that's going to be sitting on that side of the road or the building. Uh, basically, what you see is part of the four loading bays that we are showing on the south side of the building. Otherwise, the building is a very simple looking, not complicated structure. Thank you. I have no further questions. One question. Any roof mounted equipment? Uh, there will be roof mounted equipment. Is it going to be screened in any way or just? Uh, it, the depth of the building, the way we're going to be situating the we'll units. From the road. It won't be, you won't see it because it's 29 feet tall and the, the units are going to be in the center of the, the, the roof. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for this witness? Was, was the question answered about the loading on the other it's, side, oh, the existing I'm loading sorry. area? On the architectural plans, we, we do not show the loading. It's just the key plan. That's why we didn't identify the loading areas or any, any structures outside of the building. But the intent is to keep the loads, these existing loading bays the way they are. And on the north side of the building, on the existing side, we're not proposing any changes to it. Yeah, I was just looking at SK1 in the corner. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, that's right. Where this, this unit here, it looks like um, here's where the doors are. Right. If you look at those three it, X's, yeah. those are the loading bays that we're trying to keep. We didn't show any structures outside of the building. But those no, X's. No, no, okay. Those are actually the lo those loading Those are loading bays. bays. But you only have one, I think, okay, one is a, a depressed loading dock, right? That's correct. Okay. You, but you're keeping that? We're keeping all the loading bays, yes. Right. Thank you. One more question, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Sure. As the architect, do you have any preference on the color of the privacy slats? Uh, I would like to make it as uh, neutral color as we can get it, because most of this, the, the fence, realistically, is going to be hidden behind the trees that we're planting. So it needs to be either lighter color that matches the building background, so it kind of disappears with the background of the building. So like a, a, a light brownish kind of light like brownish beige, or like beige color, kind of yes. like the beige, yes. the, the lower base of the building. Yes. Okay. See, All right. Thank you. I have one more question. Is it going to be tilt-up construction when you say you're going to cast the panels? It will be cast-in-place tilt-up panels. So then you put you cast them on the ground and raise them. That's correct. The, the idea is to make it sustainable, oh, and reduce the carbon footprint. Okay. Yep. Thank you. I'm done, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, if there are no other questions for this witness and you don't have any more witnesses, I guess we can open to the public. Make a motion to open to the public. Second. All in favor? Aye. 
Aye. Okay, this meeting is open to the public for comment on this application. If there's anyone who wants to add comment, please come forward. Uh, Mr. Chairman, seeing no one coming forward, I would move that the public hearing on this application be closed. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Any summation there, Peter? Very briefly. Uh, obviously, from the pictures that were passed around, my client is probably doing a public service by taking out those houses that he just acquired. I think that the uh, application, as you heard it from the testimony of the architect and the engineer, uh, is going to be a tremendous improvement to that area, as well as obviously keeping a good, viable company in the community and creating more jobs. I would respectfully request that the variances that we are seeking be granted so that we can uh, build what we want to build. And I thank you for your time and consideration. Okay, uh, I have a motion. I'll make a motion as a retired pharmacist. I'm happy to make a motion <laughs> to a successful pharmaceutical manufacturer. And with the uh, mentioned changes in landscaping, uh, make a motion to approve. Uh, are we going to the aisle width at 24? And yes. The not, and not relocating the, the driveway? Yes. The two things, I just, those were the two things that really. Thank you. All yeah. variances and all, you know. To. Yeah, I think I mean. that <coughs> the, 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 yeah, excuse me, the impervious will go up slightly. Right. So for the preparation of the resolution, we need the exact impervious. It's My guess is it's 64.9 is proposed. If it meets 65, if it goes up to 65, it'd be surprised, but we'd right. need that figure. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would second the motion. Okay. Vince, let's call it. <coughs> Councilman Chase? Yes. Mr. LaCourt? Yes. Ms. MacGyver? Yes. Mr. Mattler? Yes. Mr. Pettit? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Onyaka? Yes. Chairman Orsini? Yes. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you very much for coming. Great. Do we have anything else for this evening? Nine. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, oh. you, you had mentioned something about uh, an executive session for reporting on the No, I, I, I said we didn't, we didn't need to know the amount or the, you know, details of the, you know, litigation unless we, we went into executive session, not that we were going to have one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Very good. That's fine then. Okay. What is the uh, do we have a uh, motion no, to adjourn? So. Make a motion to adjourn. Good luck to you.